Hey guys, and welcome back to a brand new day of Okami. Uh, it seems Hannah Valley is all nice and purified now, so maybe we should do something about Shinshu Field, Richie? Yes, that would definitely be a good idea, I feel, because obviously we managed to lift the curse in Hana Valley, and now we are going to try and do it in Shinshu Field and hopefully make it proper nice and lovely, like, you know? In it, mate, in it. Yo! I can't stop it. I don't know why. It's so ingrained in me as a Westerner to hear that sound effect and just think, Oh, Japan, it makes sense. Well, yes, but the, the thing is, Tom, is you're not quite doing the sound properly, but then, to be fair, I think if either of us did try to do the sound properly, we'd sound really racist. Well, that and I can't reach that pitch, I can barely go above what I'm speaking now without my voice just cutting out entirely. It's like, <laughs> mate, you need to stop. There's a problem downstairs. Right, so all we need to do is just draw back a little bit so that we can get the tree in our view and bloom away! For another bit of divine intervention. Be gone, foul shades. You were popular for like all of one part. But your time has come. You are like an idol in Japan. Used up and thrown away. It's awful, but it's true. <laughs> I'm just, oh my god, look at this. It's just so beautiful. I love that war effect, right? I live for these bits of divine intervention. I do just so much, they're just... Oh. It does look like a really Japanese version of Hyrule Field and Twilight Princess. It does, yes. <laughs> Which is glorious. Because, I mean, if, like, obviously, having grown up with anime and manga, I have grown to really like Japan. Uh-huh. And if there's one place that I want to visit in the world, it is Japan. I think Deji beat you there, honestly. Well, he did beat me there, but to be fair, I will get there eventually, and I will do it in my own time. So fuck you, Deji. Jesus. <laughs> so yeah, basically Japan is one of the places I just would love to visit, because I love the architecture, I love all of this mythology and folklore, I just find it so fascinating. Mm-hmm. And also, to be fair, just, it's awesome, and it's the home of, well, it's the birthplace of the, well, most video games, to be fair. Okay, let's not go to movie Bob territory, is it? I'm, I'm seeing an alarm bell, oh, and it's ringing violently. Yes, yeah, so now that we have rebirthed Shinshu Field, we're going to get a good run around the place before we actually go do anything, because... We've got um, clovers to pick up, we've got items to find, a few side quests to start, all that sort of jazz. Well, it is a 100% run. I am prepared for this mentally. So, I mean, pretty much the way the game, this walkthrough is going to take place is that we're going to spend a bit of time doing plot, then we're going to move on to side quests and alternate as we go. Basically, whenever a whole bunch of side quests open up, we're going to try and do them all in one chunk. It really is like a Zelda playthrough then, that's usually how I structure it, like our Zelda LPs. You see, it, it all works out just fine. We may not be doing, at present anyway, a Zelda game this year, So, but we are because we've got Okami and it all works out perfectly fine. Mm, well, I uh, wouldn't count your chickens before they're hatched, mate, and I'll say no more for now. Oh, plans I don't know about. <laughs> <laughs> Lots of plans you don't know about, mate, but it's fine. You don't need to be kept in the loop about everything. So, you've mentioned clovers. What else are we looking for here? Um, so it's clovers, it's the hidden chests under the ground. There's also that building over just up there that we will be heading to, which is quite important. Um, that's a clover that we can't get just yet because it's underground that's just too hard for us to dig through. Okay, so what, is that like clay and you're going to dig through mud right now? Well, it, it's more like kind of rock. Okay. Or something, I'm not really quite sure. But uh, yes, also, there's this. For so long, I can't remember whether it's called a Devil Gate or a Demon Gate, but it's something of that effect. And basically it's a little gauntlet of enemies. And you need to beat this to... Uh, just 
cleanse the area, so to speak. Well, you can't just leave it there. Like, the retail value will just plummet drastically. Exactly. These are kind of easy. There'll be ones later on that are uh, quite a lot more difficult, and there are, well, the uh, greatest challenges in the game are related to Devil Houses. I'll, I'll go with Devil Houses, it's probably completely wrong. So the three hardest challenges in the game are related to these, and you will be seeing them in their entirety. Oh, jeez. Fair warning, they are sped up because they are very long. That's fine, mate. I appreciate that. I'm sure the audience does as well. Well, yes, because otherwise, well, we'll end up taking, I can't remember exactly how long it is. It's probably about an hour and a half's worth. God damn. Well, that, that's what we're going to commentate over, perhaps. It's probably more like at least three hours worth of fighting. God damn! Yeah. I might be slightly off in my totals on that, but it is something ridiculous like that. Yeah, it sounds, so, like, uh, sounds like a pit of a hundred trials or some shit, honestly. I mean, essentially, that's what the sort of going with for that. I like how you started out all graceful with that painting and just kind of like ended it squiggles. Well, yeah, it's because... I was trying to do what I did earlier and it didn't work. <laughs> oh, well, as long as you get there in the end, I suppose. Well, exactly. I mean, it's one of the things of the Wii version with it sometimes not entirely recognising what you're doing. Okay, Richard. I mean, that one I think is my fault, um, but sometimes it really isn't. It's like I have drawn the correct shape, um, but it just won't read it as the move. Did you skip past that feeling scene? Like, were you tired of seeing the same balls eating the same seed? Yeah. Basically, I think I reached the point where I was just like, well, you know what? Um, we've seen enough feeding scenes now to know what they're like. Yeah. I think we can just go straight through. Not a bother. It's all good. I believe that we are now heading to this house over here. Well, after we've dealt with uh, this. Which, you know what, I'm, I'm going to figure out what they're called properly so that I actually get it correct, because otherwise it's going to drive me nuts. So I'm just saying, you've got the world's most powerful search engine at your fingertips there, mate. Right, so... The Okami Wiki calls it a Devil Gate or a Demon Gate. So... Uh, we can actually go for either, which is fine by me. And um, the Japanese name is Rashomon which is Demon Castle Gate, so it's probably Demon Gate. Personally, I blame the Demon Castle Gate for uh, Trump getting elected, honestly. <laughs> Man, that was a fucking clunky political joke, I apologise. Now, something actually that's quite interesting is that apparently the fights that take place in the Devil Gates, as the Okami Wiki is seeming to call them, um, is Hyaki Yagyo, which is Night Parade of a Hundred Demons, which is actually a famous phenomenon seen in Japanese folklore. Huh. The Gate of Rajman, um, or Rashman, which is the Devil Gate, um, is referred as a location where ogres and demons hide and wait for victims. So, nice little small bit of Japanese folklore there. Like, something even as small and innocuous as a fucking gauntlet is drenched in folklore. I kind of like those little touches. Indeed, it's amazing. And, I mean, I haven't even gotten into the whole thing of... So, with the imps... They have, well, you might have noticed, but they have, um, I think, katakana on their masks. Uh huh. Which all read actual things. <laughs> they are actual words in Japanese. Okay. I'm trying to find where the thing is that tells me what's on it. <laughs> yeah, you watch. You look it up, it'll just be like imp. Red imp, yellow imp, green imp. Well, I think I'm, I'm hopefully nearly there. Please, for the love of God. No, it's, it seems that the Okami Wiki is deciding to hate me right now and not give me the information that I want. Um, but I can point out that the imps are based on the Amonajaku of Japanese folklore, which is a demon-like creature um, usually depicted as a kind of small oni, which is a demon, 
and is thought to be able to provoke a person's darkest desires, and thus instigates them into perpetrating wicked deeds. Damn. Come to me, piggies. It's time for your feeding. You will make such delicious burgers. Yes, good. We are heading into this place, which is a dojo, and this is Onigiri Sensei, who is amazing. What is Onigiri? That name rings a bell. Well, it should do, because as soon as I get to the, the bit of trivia which tells me exactly what it is, an Onigiri is a rice ball, oh. which is often served in a triangular shape. Ah, oh, I love jelly filled donuts, they're my favourites. But what's really quite awesome is that if you separate the word onigiri into oni and giri, it changes rice ball into the phrase demon slaying. Nice. Which is very fitting for onigiri sensei. Oh Jesus! Because, yes, he's a transformer. He's doing a fucking beautiful Joe thing. I noticed that shit. Yes, he is. It's amazing. <laughs> So, he will teach us brand new moves, nice. like either increasing the number of combos we can do with a weapon, or actually brand new moves. Obviously it all costs yen, but that's fine by me. Well, there's a parallel to this Twilight Princess as well, with like, the old swordsman. Indeed there is, although that's... you don't have to pay the um, ancient swordsman. He just does his job for you, whereas this guy wants to get the dollar. Well, you know... Gotta get paid, man. You gotta get paid. You think that small hut's like, you know, selling itself? You've gotta maintain that shit. Good job. Basically, after you completed it once, you can just leave. Um, but if you complete it a number of times, this is what I talked about with the timing being a little bit difficult sometimes. Um, if you complete it enough times then he will give you a, I think it's, a, it's either a medium holy bone or a large holy bone and basically that will heal you in battle if you need to and yeah this is me going for god's sake why isn't it working and then eventually I think I was just like right let's do proper timing works out perfectly One thing that I would like to mention about Onigiri Sensei is that he's one of the very few characters in the entire series to have their names in the original Japanese versions written not in katakana, but entirely in kanji. So obviously in Japan there are different ways of writing. Um, you've got katakana, you've got kanji and so on. Um, naturally this means that Onigiri Sensei bears some sort of cultural relevance or importance though this is not the case for the main characters who are based on real life mythology themselves. So obviously he's important um, because of the way his name appears, but um, that's about your lot. Finally, he's going to give me my holy bone. Thank God. Nice. Even though it takes a while to get to that point, um, it is worth it in the end because at this point obviously we don't have that much money, so health items are an absolute godsend. And now he transforms back into his feeble usual self. Indeed. I can't get over the fact he did a fucking headshot into like his like master mode. I know, it's just gross, and he does it. Every single time. Kinda reminds me of Ninja from Power Rangers, really. Oh yeah, we bad. Yeah, I I, I just love the hench and a go go, baby. We should cover beautiful Joe on this channel. I'm gonna push for it now. Okay, I I Hmm. I will have to get it at some point somehow. I will find a way. Mm hmm GameCube version preferable. Yes. You know, I got like, um, 20 minutes, maybe an hour tops into Viewable Joe 2. And I remember I was like trying to push a snowball around as part of a puzzle. And then I just stopped. I don't know why, it just didn't grab me the same way as the first game did. I don't know. Kind of sad, really. Yeah, well, I mean, to be fair, that is pretty much the curse that um, most Hideki Kamiya titles have had is that 
Hideki Kamiya has dealt with the first game in pretty much every series he's ever created, and while he may have written the plots for later titles, he didn't direct them. That has always kind of seemed to prove key, because Hideki Kamiya has a really specific way of directing his games. Like, you can tell when it's a Kamiya product, easily. Because even though sometimes certain decisions may seem a little bit overindulgent, everything sticks together into a really nice cohesive whole, and the entire package... Nice timing on that, by the way. What? Nice timing on that, by the way, with the hole appearing in the ground and everything. <laughs> you see, it's all planned, every last bit of it. But, yeah, so it, Hideki Kamiya creates games that are an amazing package. And it's something that pretty much every director who's taken on one of his projects in the, like, the sequel has never quite managed to pull off as effectively, and it's because they either over streamline things or don't manage to capture what made the first game quite so spectacular. Because obviously even though I absolutely adore both Bayonetta and Bayonetta 2, and I would say that gameplay wise Bayonetta 2 is the most accessible and probably the most fun. Yeah, you're right here, because uh, Hideki Kamiya wrote Beautiful Joe 2, but the director was uh, Masaki Yamada. Exactly, and while Hideki Kamiya was the supervisor and wrote the story for Bayonetta 2, he wasn't the director. So, it's it's frustrating. He's got such a great vision, it's why I'm so, so gutted that Scalebound got cancelled. Because, while obviously I know the footage didn't necessarily look entirely as amazing, because obviously it probably... Well, it seems like it might have been slightly focus tested to death, but then I know that Hideki Kamiya doesn't really listen to focus testing because of the whole. There's a whole anecdote with Beautiful Joe where he they, they focus tested it with a group of kids, and the kids I think were just basically shit talking the game and saying, "Oh look how kiddy it looks, and the characters look stupid, and so on and so forth." And Hideki Kamiya was just like. Haha, <laughs> you're talking crap. And so he made the game harder. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love that, he's such a fucking troll. I know. I mean, there's also a really wonderful story of, well, to do with Bayonetta's glasses. So I think there were some higher ups, I think at Sega, potentially at Platinum as well. I don't know. I can't remember what the full anecdote is. But basically, they, I think in a meeting, were just like, could we maybe try her without glasses? And he was just like, no, the glasses stay. End of story. Yeah, it kind of pulls the whole design together, really. Exactly. And also, it's a whole theme throughout the game, because every single character has a pair of glasses on them, whether they're wearing them or not. In my mind, it's... In the English literature sense, um, it's all to do with sight and perception, oh. and it's really quite fascinating when you look at the characters in that way. But uh, that's going a little bit too deep into a game which is not this one. <laughs> yeah, sorry, I was kind of blown away by the scale and framing of like this port to another area. Well, yes, it's because it's a very important route to another area, because this is the Moon Cave, and this is where Orochi is hiding. Well, not necessarily hiding, he's pretty clear that he's he's there. <laughs> I'm definitely not hiding. I'm resting. <laughs> I'm resting up. Um, but yes, this is where Orochi's lair is. And so it's obviously a hugely important area, but there's very little we can do about it right now. This is not Breath of the Wild. You can't just run to the final boss immediately after escaping the tutorials. You know they've said they're uh, going to focus on Breath of the Wild in terms of like style for future Zelda games? Yes. I think that's a good thing to go with. Maybe like... I think so. Use that as a, a framework and build on top of it. Because <laughs> Zelda was getting a wee bit stale, and I'm sorry if you enjoy Skyward Sword. It was the most modern Zelda of all modern Zeldas, and I do not mean that as a compliment. It was the most 
streamlined in a bad way. It was the most casual friendly with hints and markers and such. And it just... I, like, I don't really care about tutorials and whatnot. You know, you can skip them if you want to most of the time. But there needs to be a little sense of, you know, danger and adventure to figuring stuff out in games. And that just didn't have it, unfortunately. No, I mean, basically, I think... I mean, I enjoyed Skyward Sword I did quite parts. a lot for its... I really enjoyed its narrative, I think, because it was quite cinematic. And I quite enjoyed its mood. And I did find the gameplay fun, but I totally get that it it's streamlined to oblivion. Yeah. And it's the way it breaks down everything is a little bit weird. But yeah, if you haven't played Breath of the Wild yet, play Breath of the Wild. It's freaking amazing. <laughs> I'm waiting to get a Switch before I do, and then I'm going to get it like that. Marikai Deluxe, Snake Pass, Spectre of Torment, Arms, maybe Splatoon 2, because uh, that new wave shooter mode they showed off in the, the uh, latest yes. Direct is pretty Rush. fun. Yeah, it's basically a horde mode, but uh, that'll do us for now. Please join us next time, where we promise to actually include Okami in these tangents. See you next time.